This is an episode we've wanted to record for a long time. At the age of 25, Robbie Ferguson, alongside his brother James, have built a mutable X into a billion dollar company. Robbie is a prolific thinker, and this week we spoke about his drivers, debated the case for Web3, and explored his leadership lessons. We came away from this episode massively inspired, and we hope you do too. Enjoy the episode. And we're live. Hello and welcome back to Sachin and Adam show. So on this very fine Tuesday night, we're very privileged to be joined in our Darlinghurst um, podcast studio with the one and only Robbie Ferguson. I'm insanely excited for today. Robbie Ferguson is the co-founder of Immutable, which is one of the biggest Web3 crypto gaming startups in the world and also one of the fastest companies in Australia to reach a billion dollar valuation. So if you've been living under a rock, Immutable is currently valued at $2.5 billion, I think it is. And just earlier this year, they raised $200 million. Robbie's done a bunch of different stuff before. He's been a TL fellow. He dropped out of CompSci and uh, Law. And we're really keen to dig in today a little bit about him, but also about Immutable, the Web3 movement, and have a little bit of sparring about everything that's happening in the crypto world. So thanks a lot for coming on today. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. And so, Robbie, we start. We like to start off our podcast by kind of humanizing our guests a little bit, because a lot of people who are watching this think Robbie, twenty five, founder of a billion dollar company with his brother. That's you know, I'd never be like that. So, we'd love to kind of try and ask you, who are you at your core? What what drives you at your core outside of Immutable, outside of all this hype around the last couple of years? Yeah. Uh, so. There's probably a few answers to this question, I'd say. First, I am pretty similar at work to what I am in my personal life. Uh, I would say the main difference is my fundamental goal at work is how do I contribute as effectively as possible? Um, you know, my, my fundamental goal in, in my personal life is um, going to be many different things, many of which is, is sort of relationship driven and, and sort of, you know, friendship driven. Um, I'm definitely a hundred percent extroverted. So I draw oh. a lot of my energy from, from being around people. Uh, I would say I'm pretty nerdy. Uh, so if you like my, my big life mission is some, but incrementally help the world to move towards, uh, you know, post economic scarcity and sort of a, a, a utopian civilization. I think there's a few key levers to get there. I think crypto is a major one uh, at its sort of best. It is, essentially a new incentive structure for the world and the only thing that's really going to move humanity towards uh, a better place or ever has has been the right incentive structures paired with progress because progress without the right incentives leads to inequality leads to uh, apps that optimize for retention based on you know essentially damaging um, human experiences and uh, the other thing I'd say is uh, I'm an extremely passionate but terrible um, athlete so I love <laughs> exercise um, I'm, I'm really bad at it I've just picked up boxing um, I do a bunch of weightlifting I'm not particularly good at any of it but I find it's the number one thing that keeps me sane um, so yeah, look, they're definitely a normal, uh, <laughs> a normal person. Um, and just trying to, I think, focus on where I can make the biggest leverage differences. Um, yeah. Awesome. That was a really interesting spiel on the exercise point. I'm pretty sure I saw an Instagram story of you this morning going for a run in flip flops or wearing slides, which is interesting choice. Yeah. That probably wasn't <laughs> a run. As as it was a okay. Run. I hope not. I hope <laughs> yeah. not. So in preparation for this podcast, we've obviously done research on you and talked to a few people that know you, and we've heard some different anecdotes. Some of them include you were really good at debating, you loved games like RuneScape, League of Legends, yep. two of my favorite games, also a really academic kid. So there's a bunch of interesting different things there. How do you sort of characterize yourself growing up? So when you were in high school, what were the things that were driving you when you were doing all these disparate activities? What was going on in your mind who were you when I, you were younger yeah look honestly i think high school you're pretty much on rails so like i, I don't think you ever become an autonomous person until you're like 18 and, and doing things and i certainly felt a massive shift in agency once i left school so to some extent you, you go through a schooling system and it is a function of you know what's the, the pressure you're you know my, my parents always put a, a very high value to what they teach you values early on right and they put a very high value on academic success um you know my, my dad was very risk tolerant uh, and so he put a very high value on going and doing crazy stuff and I, I remember when I first told him the idea of like hey we're gonna go and build um this this NFT infrastructure platform 
And he said, well, you know, that's cool, but, like, it'd be way cooler if you were building a, a sovereign nation on, like, <laughs> you know, a, a sea setting. So, like, he's always been quite radical. I think it's very helpful for removing some of the boundaries that you need to if you're going to take risks and, and approach things. Um, but, yeah, look, I, I love debating at school. I was a very, very nerdy kid. I love maths, um, English, uh, you know, your, your standard kind of um, nerdy Sydney high schooler. Uh, I think... There were lots of learnings from that. I think debating is probably the best thing I did uh, in terms of helping me do what I do today. Interestingly, not for the reasons you think. In fact, actively, it feeds into a lot of how I try and run things at business into, you know, opinions shouldn't matter that much because people will have different levels of ability to argue things. What should really matter is data-driven culture and how you make decisions in a very structured manner and allowing everyone to have objective views that are assessed in the same way. Where it is really helpful is, you know, being persuasive and convincing and helping people join the mission, I think. And that's an invaluable skill that school will not by default teach you. So if I ever see someone going through the schooling system, I say the number one thing you should do is pick up debate because it just teaches you how to think, how to argue and how to be persuasive, probably most importantly than, than the other two. Uh, and the other thing was I was incredibly unfit. I was completely <laughs> non-athletic at school. Debating was my sport, I believe. Um, and I think that was actually a really sad thing is how we've kind of, to some extent, dichotomized, you know, being nerdy and, and being sporty. I think yeah. they should absolutely be combined. I think performance is best often when it's combined. Um, and I know my life personally is a lot better now that I have sort of that as a regular regimen. Yeah, that's super interesting. It seems like you're intellectually fit though, which is which is pretty important. And Robbie, since these last kind of couple of years have been pretty crazy for you with Immutable and all the publicity and stuff like that. And for someone that's probably still in your 20s, it was, must have been a big change. I'm really curious to hear if your friends would have described that the fame or the success has changed you in any way. And how do you think that's changed your lifestyle, the way you live? I am definitely not famous. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm like de definitely, I'm not saying that. No, no one I've seen your Twitter profile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, and, and, and you, you have and you realize you're not, right? It's not, it's not that many followers. I think it's enough to have influence within a sphere. Um, even people who are actually business famous are not famous. Yeah. Um, so it's very different to, I think, celebrity or celebrity fame. Yeah. Um, it's not something that I think I would be overly keen on pursuing. Yeah. I'd be much more interested in having an impact than, than uh, achieving that. I think it's this interesting double-edged sword where it is so powerful to have a platform, particularly because many of the people in crypto who have a platform are not always the best representatives of crypto. Yeah. You know, they're either kind of pretty shilly or they end up being disgraced as is pretty much every main character in, in crypto Twitter to date. Um, yeah. So it's sort of- A lot of libertarians there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it would have uh, changed me too much. I try and stay pretty much the same in habits, routines. Um, you know, I think I, I kind of keep all the same friends. Um, Something else you did when you were younger is that you went and did computer science and law at Sydney Uni. For most young sort of nerdy people, that would seem like <laughs> the degree to do. Like, that is the dream. You ended up dropping out and you did the TL fellowship instead. Why did you end up dropping out? And what was that experience of the TL Fellowship like? Because as most people know, Peter Thiel is a very controversial but fascinating character. I don't think anyone can disagree with that. So we have zero to, to one here. Zero to one yeah, should somewhere. be somewhere yeah, it's just there. right there. <laughs> yeah. Great book. Um, yeah, can you run us through that a little bit? Yeah, so the first question was CompSci Law. Yeah, why drop out? Well, so I did CompSci Law. There were only three people who did that degree in that year. And one of the other people was Alex Connolly, my co-founder. Um, and then Jason uh, with the third person, I think he's working at a crypto market maker right now. <laughs> um, so it's a pretty interesting uh, funnel of that selection of, of people. Um, the dropout question was actually very easy, which was it wasn't really a, a choice that we had to make. By the time it came around to the new university year, we had already built in the Christmas holidays and shipped Etherbots, which was the blockchain game we built. Um, and that had gone viral and made a couple of million dollars in revenue. So it was pretty easy to say, hey, we're going to focus on this full time. And, and James uh, quit his job, which was as the lead uh, engineer at Appliances Online, a, a billion dollar e-commerce store. Um, and I, I dropped out of university, as did Alex. Okay. And so fast forward to where Immutable is at now. We'd love to kind of start off this part of the conversation by you explaining your own words, what Immutable X is and what you're trying to build, because I think um, we don't want to bastardize <laughs> 
the magic in what you're building. Yeah. So Immutable X is a platform by which anyone can really easily build a Web3 game. And the vision long-term is much broader than just gaming, but that is the core use case we're focused on today because that's where we think the next 100 million to a billion users of Web3 are going to come from and the next trillion dollars traded of true digital property rights are going to come from. If, to get a little bit more de- technical, uh, we do a few things. So we have a ZK roll-up scaling engine for NFTs, which we partner with Starquare on. We have a set of very easy to use APIs that anyone can build on. So pretty much everyone else out there is building smart contracts or proprietary kind of programming languages like Rust or Cadence uh, that you have to use in order to build on that platform. We've gone on the approach of if this is going to go mainstream, it has to be extremely, extremely simple for businesses to build businesses on Web3. You know, this should be like launching a website or a shop or, you know, building a mobile game. You know, that there are complexities, but they should be domain specific, like building a good game, not how do I inject Web3 into my game meaningfully. Um, and the, the other part is that we also have immutable studios. So obviously a, a lot of the headcount and focus is immutable platform, um, but we also build two games internally and publish more games under, I guess, primary uh, content is what we'd call it. And that's led by Justin Hulog, um, who we recently brought on from, from Riot Games, who was running Asia there. Uh, so the whole goal is how can we create meaningful Web3 games where players can have actual property rights over stuff. They can sell it, they can own it, they can have uh, finite scarcity, streamers can have better monetization methods, and fundamentally, we can fix what is a very broken relationship between the game creator and the game player and make it so that their incentives are aligned in the long term. So Robbie, um, you spoke before about this kind of utopian future that you imagine. I'm sure that's kind of driven by the the sci-fi upbringing and reading and gaming a lot. I think a lot of people listening would see how Web3 can bring about that kind of society. And I think a lot of people have edu- are now educated on like, you know, digital property rights and what blockchain can do. Why gaming to start off with? Yeah, it's a great question. So first off, when we started, gaming was really all there were to NFTs, right? So we, we, we basically created one of the first ever use cases of NFTs when we released Etherbots in December 2017. It's the first multiplayer game uh, on the blockchain. All of the logic was on chain. And so to us, the vision from the start was not selecting gaming out of a bunch of categories. It was, this is the most obvious thing to transform. And why is it obvious? Well, gamers spend $100 billion every single year, not on accessing Call of Duty, but on the skins inside Fortnite, the coins inside Candy Crush. It's literally digital property that they're throwing into the void. They own $0 of this, They can sell zero dollars of it in the limited use cases where they have some tradability on a centralized server, like a gray marketplace, like, you know, Steam, Counter-Strike, Go, they get shut down. And there are countless stories of gamers losing, you know, even today, Diablo uh, by Blizzard actually shut down a huge amount of utility for players and players would spend literally tens of thousands of dollars in this game, just quit. Um, Counter-Strike Go, at the time we launched, had one of the most thriving gray marketplaces in the world and hundreds of millions of dollars of equity value in these items was lost and a business known as Opskins, which is worth $300 million, went bankrupt when Valve decided to restrict trading to once per week. So it was both, well, hey, they're spending all this money, but also they're constantly getting exploited by simulations of, of what should really just be true property rights. Um, and then I think it's just the the philosophical idea that just because something is intangible doesn't mean that you shouldn't have property rights to it. And I think that's where the broader mission comes in. The world is becoming increasingly digital. It's very likely in 30 to 50 years, people spend all or or most of their time in some form of augmented or virtual reality. We already do today, you know, like our phones are essentially an extension of our brains and the way that we use them. And everything from how you live uh, to how you socialize to how you work is going to be formed as value inside these digital universes and i think it's incredibly important that those are built on platform infrastructure and incentive infrastructure and commercials that aren't meta charging 52.5 percent that aren't an insecure blockchain where people can kind of take things away from you and that isn't a centralized server this really is a pivotal point where we get to determine hey 
does the fundamental physics that gives people custody rights in the real world around owning a house, around owning sneakers, around owning, you know, anything that is in their possession, should that extend to the digital world? Um, and I think it's an incredibly important question. Yeah, I want, I want to try and challenge your thesis, which is going to be quite difficult because that was actually extremely compelling, <laughs> the idea of all this equity value being locked up in games and they belong to the games, they don't yeah. exist outside of the games. From a devil's advocate uh, sort of standpoint, you could potentially say that integrating NFTs and crypto with all these games, it could make it potentially more expensive for people to sort of get into the games and yeah. for them to get like really good and create potentially like more inequality. Um, and it could also sort of lead to more of a dollar's sort of value focus on games rather than just playing and really enjoying games. And you start thinking about the money you can create and it all becomes about sort of boosting, I don't know, dollars of uh, yeah, yeah. certain items. What would your response to that be? Two, two awesome questions. So I think the first one is, uh, will games become too prohibitively expensive to enter into play? And the fundamental answer to that is you can build whatever game you like with whatever technology you like. What Web3 does is it changes the commercial incentives of the people creating these games. And there's always going to be counterexamples. You know, I, I think a bunch of the, the, the NFT games out there uh, today or the, the collectibles are, are sort of, you know, pretty short-lived revenue-grabbing projects. But fundamentally what this does over the medium and long term is it drives the business model to be one where people want to appreciate the equity value of these NFTs and give people ownership of stuff rather than extracting. And so the example I use is Magic the Gathering Arena. So, you know, this physical card beloved by a lot of people and every year they make new seasons of cards and they deprecate or diminish the value of earlier seasons in order to make the new ones attractive. And they have to do this because that's how they make revenue. The estimated secondary market cap of all MTG cards in existence, so physical ones, is $20 billion dollars. If they could take secondary clips on people trading them, then fundamentally their business model is A, still viable, but B, now aligned with players. Their job is to grow the value of that economy over time, to create cards which add new complexity but don't make old ones boring, and to even create new contexts in which these assets can be valuable. So I think everything at the end of the day comes down to incentives, and Web3 is the first time that players can have skin in the game and truly be on the same level of incentives as these games. And then, of course, I think there's more radical concepts, right? Which is Jeff Bezos talks about how your margin is my opportunity. And he used that to you know, revolutionize a, a series of industries, essentially, on, on the back of making stuff cheaper for consumers, which, you know, by, by all means, it was, was good for those consumers. Web3 is the, the insane extrapolation of that, where users and creators can own 100% of profits. And the most successful games are the ones which give the most out to players. So the simple example of this is Alluvium, which is built on Immutable, which recently did the largest Web3 gaming sale of all time. 72 million US dollars in a weekend. You know, that's wow. record breaking for like Fortnite. Yeah. Who, who hasn't achieved those stats? Well, what is, what's the game like? Like, Yeah, well, it's it's three games. Okay. So it's it's both a auto battler. Yeah. It's a, a RPG where you can kind of collect Pokemon. Yeah. Um, and it, there's also like a, a much bigger vision game, but they're kind of staging the approach. Yeah. Okay. Um, they have I think over 200 full time employees. There's a bunch of them in Sydney. Um, so it's I mean it's a it's a yeah. very very credible project. A hundred percent of the revenue from any sales of Alluvium, not even profit revenue, goes to every token holder of ILV. And so I think that's the the kind of new model that this stuff can exist as. And then I think there's the simpler side and probably the less complex side, which is just like players don't necessarily have to make money off this stuff. It's just about instead of you playing Hearthstone for two years and sinking thousands of dollars into cards and you having nothing to show, instead there's an economy where you have value at the end of the day and there are new you know, emergent kind of market opportunities and business opportunities for that. But all the same principles around making it as accessible as possible will still apply because you still want to get people into your game. You still want to give them value. So the third, and I realize this is a long answer, but there's actually quite a lot of um, detailed reasons as to why Web3 at multiple layers will, will ultimately produce pro player games. And the third answer is if you look at the natural trend of gaming over the past two decades, it's gone from, hey, I like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 for 80 bucks to, hey, I play a free-to-play game where I monetize via in-game transactions. And by the way, free-to-play was an incredibly controversial move when it came out. And we're now at the point where two games in China will compete that are complete clones of each other 
on the basis of who can sell cheaper in-game transactions. So they say my Clash Royale clone has you know, cheaper skins than the other one. The natural extrapolation of this is in order to attract users, you have to give value, not just make your in-game transactions cheaper. And so you know, this ridiculous kind of uh, process is fully transformed by a process where instead you're just giving players value. You're taking the billion dollars you're spending on Google ads and you're using it to back an economy where players can receive assets from playing the game, from sharing the game, and that is the method by which you grow. It's your viral coefficient, it's your retention increases. Um, and I think we've seen this, like you know, Pokemon Go, which is one of the most profitable games of all time, was basically all word of mouth. There was almost zero performance marketing on that. And now Web3 is enabling games to compete with giant budgets because they can give players skin in the game and incentives to share beyond just what they can kind of put up front from a AAA budget. Yeah, it seems like there's obviously so many great incentives and aspects of blockchain and Web3 gaming. But at the moment, there's a huge tension, especially an argument that's happening on Twitter. You sort of got the crypto fanatics and nerds on one side, which is still very long-term bullish. They're never sort of deviating from what they believe. And then you've got a lot of people that have become really sceptical with a lot of crashes, some frauds, um, not seeing as many sort of valuable use cases in yeah. Web3. So let's say that you sort of took the opinion of you're actually a Web3 sceptic. Let's say in five years' time, Web3, it's no longer a thing. Um, nobody believes in it. There's no sort of use cases being built on it. Why do you think, what do you think will be the reason if Web3 does fail as a concept? Let's say it's not deterministic, but it does fail. Nobody believes in it. What's the biggest reason why it would fail? Um, I mean, regulation is definitely an existential risk at some levels uh, in the short run. I, I think Web3 is pretty inevitable in the long run. Um, mainly because I think it will create cheaper prices uh, for stuff and cheaper prices always wins. Um, so like if you look at tradable assets, NFTs are by far a superior standard to trade this stuff, particularly when you consider that an NFT is not just the ability to have digital property rights. That's actually a very thin reason of why stuff will be tokenized. It is a liquidity premium and a utility premium. And what do I mean by this? how much would you spend on a house in an economy where there was one mortgage provider and they charged interest rates of fixed 20% per annum? The housing demand would be vastly diminished, right? Because the surrounding financial services, which enable primary demand, are not mature. DeFi is building the largest honeypot of the most competitive set of financial services ever created. And it is instantaneously and permissionlessly available to any asset which exists not as a Web2 asset, but as an NFT. So a huge driving force for the tokenization of gaming assets, but also houses, intellectual property, music rights, um, stocks, bonds, financial instruments, is going to be this ability to tap into decentralized finance by just tokenizing this stuff. Um, and so that's one reason why I think it's it's pretty inevitable. I realize I'm I'm refuting your question rather than <laughs> answering it. Um, but the second thing I think is uh, there's just an insane amount of capital and talent pouring into the space. And if you look at any successful industry in the past, the greatest leading indicators is where does the smart money go? So VCs, it's literally their job to be right about the future. And right now, VCs are all making enormous and sustained bets on Web3. Web3 Gaming has had more than $8.5 billion in funding in the last 18 months. That's pretty much more than went to do gaming for the first decade of this century. So for it to fail at this point, you know, you could throw that much money in a toaster and it would like, <laughs> revolutionize an industry, right? So I, I think that's uh, a, a really significant point, but also the talent. If you look at where the best talent from Meta, from AAA gaming studios, from some of the smartest people in the world, they're all pouring into Web3. And so, and, and literally, even in the bear run, they've done studies of like 2018, 2020, the amount of devs building on Ethereum still grew uh, because it's pretty much a one-way door. Once you get obsessed with the future that smart contracts and that DeFi and that NFTs can build, you don't really go back because you can see the potential of, of where this is going. And it has progressed so fast in literally what, like seven years since the advent of Ethereum um, uh, 14 or when was 2009, um, 13 years since the advent of, of Bitcoin. This is not a terribly long period of time. We've already created a trillion dollar industry uh, 
And, and this is an incredibly fast progress rate for pretty much any nascent vertical. I, I agree with um, so much of the theory and all these brilliant use cases that can be brought out, but still over the past six months has just been, I'm taking a very critical lens, there's still been so much chaos in the space. Like we've seen the collapse of Terra, so many sort of DeFi providers, so many NFTs yeah. being shills and shams and whatnot. Like w what's the sort of response to that? Like when you look at sort of the theory of what this stuff could bring out and then the reality of what we've seen in the past six months, like why has all this stuff happened, all these sort of chaos look disruptions? At the, look scams. at the dot-com bubble, right? Like the internet is one of the greatest inventions of all time. You still had a bunch of scams coming out in 99 and, and popping in 2000. If you have VC money pumping into the space, you, you will get scalpers and, and sort of um, poorly incentivized individuals. It's why my favorite time to build has been bear markets and why I think the best thing that Immutable ever did was be born into the biggest bear market. I completely agree with you. I think these are, are terrible projects that have pushed back the space, um, that have been you know, marketed perhaps fraudulently in, in, in certain circumstances. It's why Immutable only cares, not about speculative NFT volume, but building utility-driven NFT volume, where the reason people trade stuff is not, hey, I wanna buy some crazy luxury speculative asset for tens of thousands of dollars. It's instead, I want to buy this asset that has utility inside a game. I can show it off. I can use it in a, a, a match. The average trade price of Gods Unchained is a buck, right? And, and we trade you know, tens and tens of thousands of these a day. And that's the world we see where, hey, I'm, I'm kind of trading the skin that I got in this game or, or this asset, and we're building real economies in the same way we kind of you know, trade stuff in everyday society. What do you think about the um, game experience of Web3 games right now versus, I, I think Web2 is the wrong way to describe it, but just the traditional gaming industry in general? Because I think from us, me and Adam aren't crypto natives, and we still hear a lot about the traditional games. But we don't hear that much about the experience on some of these Web3 games. And I think at the heart of the bull run, you saw some pretty ridiculous games where people were playing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and if you go past six months back in time, there were very, very few even meaningful real Web3 games being yeah. built, right? So like the whole gaming supply has been very supply side constrained. You had a bunch of profile picture projects uh, emerge because it's very easy to spin up 10,000 instances of art. It's very difficult to spin up a credible game in 12, 18 months, even if you have hundreds of millions of dollars being poured into projects. So we're going to see the supply come online over the next year. Uh, but I think the user experience of games today is in a very interesting position where Broadly, it's, it's not great for onboarding um, and there's a lot to be done here. And so I think some of the people who are, are doing best, you know, Aglet recently built on Immutable. I think they're the second or third largest Web3 game in the world right now with like 4 million oh. users. Um, and, and that's because they abstract a lot of stuff away, right? I mean, like Vivi, who, who does a lot of the Disney content in Immutable, um, abstracts a lot of stuff away. Uh, where I think we need to get to is we play a game that has 100 million users and none of them know what, the web three is under the surface mm. or like 1%. It's like people who are understanding, I don't know how HTTPS works or, or some like complex, um, how, how Unreal Engine works in the game that they're playing, right? It's like, sure, like you can check it out, but the value is the value you're experiencing as an end user. And that's where we have to get to. By the same token, we've also had games which by leveraging web three, despite all of the uh, massive friction that crypto onboarding has had, has been able to onboard you know, people faster and, and with more viral coefficients and, and with more raving evangelism than any game before in history. I mean, look at the, the sort of um, short-lived success of Axie Infinity as they, they grew to kind of monumental heights. And I think that's because you have the most powerful incentive and user acquisition tool ever generated, which is tokens. It's like giving everyone equity in your company, but you can do it to billions of people. You can do it programmatically and scalably. And that is why I'm fundamentally bullish on Web3. Over time, fees on everything go to an equilibrium of zero, unless you have some inefficiency in a system. And now we're able to build protocols and systems for things where everyone can be a part of it. Like the reason I fell in love with Ethereum is I read the white paper and they talked about a decentralized Uber where fees could be incredibly low and everyone who is part of this partner network could be like owning shares in this Uber protocol. We haven't seen that happen in the real world because there's it's a big gap for that stuff to happen. We have, though, seen the same happen for DAOs and financial infrastructure beyond what anyone imagined could be possible. So I think that's why I'm so uh, fundamentally bullish.
Mm. I want to touch on NFTs just for a moment. So like what Immutable is doing is gaming NFTs. One of the reasons that makes a lot of sense to me is that it's a lot, probably a lot harder to copy a gaming NFT than a standard NFT. If I've got like a board Ape Yacht Club, you can sort of create a screenshot and be like, I copied that. It'd be a lot harder for gaming one. So are you equally as bullish for just like sort of normal NFTs, ones that are pictures? And what would be your sort of like uh, playback to someone that's saying, I can just copy that screenshot it? Like what's the sort of value in that? Yeah, thing? well, I mean, this one's been tried. This is a, a, a debate which has been had a lot, uh, which is I, I think had a pretty conclusive answer, which is digital art is superior to real art. I mean, I can create a copy of an artwork. I can create a copy of the Mona Lisa. It's not valuable. Uh, maybe it's worth 10 grand, maybe it's worth its value as a fraud. Um, but the real value is in I can prove ownership and I can show it off as a method of status. And Web3 is clearly superior for this because now you don't just show it in your home or a museum, you can show it on the internet for hundreds of millions of people to watch. You can have it be turned into skins and derivative products. You can have intellectual property rights. I mean, I think Bored Apes has actually been incredibly pioneering. And, and it's creating like this, this brand new, um, essentially lifestyle brand and set of incentives around an autonomous brand that's going to grow over time. Now, there's lots of execution. Uh, you, you've, you've still got to solve execution. I think where DAOs have really struggled is on proving that governance is a good way of actually executing against a strategic plan. Um, I think where it's been mostly used as a, as a form of regulatory arbitrage, um, in order to kind of, you know, avoid being an actual company. Um, but over time, that will be solved and they will become an exceptional form of governance and uh, businesses will become more and more modular um, and they'll all be interacting with each other as, as Lego pieces. I think a lot of my long-term views is, if anyone has read it, informed by Accelerando, um, which is a reasonably well-written book, but basically the, the entire back end of the society operates in, in how I think smart contracts will be operated one day. Um, so, yeah, pretty bullish on that. Did that answer the question? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a question a lot of our audience will have is around the ETH merge, and I feel like that's happening in a few months. I think John gave me the date before. And one of your value props of Immutable is um, zero knowledge roll up and obviously kind of combating some of the issues with ETH as a layer one, yeah. the gas fees that I think a lot of our crypto native audience will know about. Um, how's Immutable going to change with, with the ETH merge? Is there any strategic plan around that? Yeah, there's not really much we need to do with the merge. Yeah. Um, there's obviously sequence stages after that, which will have different impacts on Ethereum. The merge main impact, when impact scale, it'll just basically reduce issuance of Ethereum and improve the security of Ethereum. Yep. And the way it will do that will be through twofold. One, we're switching from uh, a proof of work to proof of stake. So instead of miners uh, spending a bunch of energy performing arbitrary math calculations to secure the network, instead it will be people staking. So saying, hey, based on the amount of Ethereum that I own, I'm guaranteeing some outcome. And if they lie, they get penalized. And that will make it A, more secure, so right now, proof of work for Ethereum is incredibly secure. It's very, very expensive to attack, but state actors could do it. China could absolutely do it if they wanted to. And this will move it to a stage where that pretty much will be infeasible, even for the largest state actors in the world. Uh, the second thing it's going to do is it's going to make Ethereum effectively permanently deflationary. So right now you have uh, over 10,000 Ethereum being created every day as a reward purely to incentivize miners. You also have around 1,600 being paid out as, as sort of staking rewards, which is what it's only going to be the remaining reward when we switch to um, post-merge. So issuance is going to be reduced by roughly 90%. <laughs> Excuse me. And finally, the whole thing is going to become carbon uh, very minimal. So Ethereum will become 99.9% .9 more carbon efficient, and that's because we no longer have a bunch of GPUs, you know, just using an absurd amount of electricity um, every day, which is awesome. Immutable is, is completely carbon neutral. Um, so we think that's incredibly important for brands. But the scale is still going to be effectively five NFT transactions per second, 15 ERC, 20 transactions per second. Um, and even at the scale that we're conducting today, which is around 10,000 TPS, it's not enough for what these games are going to want to do, which is why we're building our cross roll up liquidity which means you can have hundreds of L2s or L3s all connected by no trusted bridges, uh, but a completely decentralized way where all of your users, funds, and liquidity can be kind of pulled across any one of these. So you could be on the existing L2, you could have your funds, and you could buy something on 
you know, the dedicated Fortnite layer three that comes out and there's no loss of liquidity, no loss of user funds and no loss of security. The reason this is so significant is the only reason to invent a new layer one is to improve scale. And they have to always bootstrap an ecosystem from scratch. That's why SWE and Aptos and all these new L1s have to raise buckets of cash from VCs and then go through the whole process of cloning the DeFi efforts of Ethereum and then go through the process of, you know, in some cases, simulating a, an active ecosystem that you saw on the news recently. And this whole, like, you know, gibberish is going to go away because we don't have to compromise on uh, the network effects of this. They'll be unified, but we can build scale composably across many L2s and L3s. And this is why Vitalik has been talking about Solving cross roll up liquidity is one of the key solutions that we need to do um, over the last two years. And, and, and this is, you know, Immutable is, is going to be the first to market with an answer to it. That's fascinating. For all of our blockchain experts out there, that was a brilliant <laughs> spiel. Now, I'd love to get on to the topic of company building, because obviously being in crypto and Web3, you've been building this company that's reached like 250 staff. You've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I'd love to first... I sort of we're ask at, you we're 300 now actually 300 yeah that's massive that's massive i'd love to hear about the differences of experiences because once you're with uh, two other co-founders putting this together then sort of 20 people now 300 how's that experience changed like what's it been like when you went from like sub 20 to now 300 i mean it's completely different um you have to learn how to operate with a different level of leverage at each level and the activities you do are fundamentally different the only thing that has been the reason we've been able to do it is probably books and coaching, uh, just constantly learning, okay, what is the job now? And I think the rate at which you learn is the most limiting factor on anything you do, particularly in crypto, because domain knowledge is pretty much useless when the space changes every six months. Um, the only thing that matters is what's your approach to thinking? What's your culture? What's your approach to learning? And that will, what enables you to kind of, succeed at every stage. I'd also say a good dose of urgency at every stage. So like a real sense of we have to get there first. We have to be incredibly aggressive in hitting our next milestones is really like you will not get a startup off the ground if you do not have a sense of urgency. It will never work. Um, so yeah, that's been the main things. And then the books I would probably recommend uh, scaling up has been incredibly good um, for I think the size of company that we are today uh, and, and, even up to, I think, a 1,000, it'll be incredibly useful. Um, the great CEO within, very, very short, very pragmatic hour-long book by the Coinbase CEO's coach, Matt Mokery. That was super good. We read that early. We basically implemented that like a Bible. Um, it taught us a bunch of stuff that we didn't know how to do. And there's been a lot of stuff in between. So on the personal side, I really valued 15 commitments to conscious leadership and radical candor. Um, I think that taught me to communicate very effectively because I've been best friends with James since birth, right? And we had been very, very close. And then suddenly you add on this process of building a business with someone and it becomes very difficult. You know, big fights in the first six months. And we both very consciously committed, hey, we need to learn how to communicate in a way that means we never fight. And literally we, we committed to this. We read these books. Um, we, we developed a system of communication and I haven't fought with him in you know four and a half years. Wow. Um, even personally, because that's how powerful this kind of, these techniques are effectively of, of just like communicating well. Um, and the reason I think that's good is it meant we designed a very conscious culture from day one, rather than just being people who kind of got along well and, and weren't as deliberative in how they set up the culture of, of the organization and the methods of comms. Is, is there any kind of features of that design you could speak to? Cause really interested. Yeah. Uh, the most powerful technique is the concept of being above or below the line and being conscious of where you are. It is inevitable and being be below the line is just, you know, living all the characteristics that you don't want to be, you know, being kind of guilt-driven, accusatory, et cetera. And then above the line is, is the idea of you're approaching with curiosity, you're, you're open, you're like in a good place to any conversation. And any conversation can be had from either above or below the line. And we literally would just, because we have a very high degree of just psychological safety. And we just gave ourselves permission to be like, are you above the line or below the line? And you'd be pissed off for 10 seconds, you know, you, if you want to do your argument, but then you're like, actually, no, I'm below the line. Give me a minute, give me five minutes, give me an hour if you need it. But it's just your awareness, right? And then the second thing was realizing that conflict is inevitable. And so if it's inevitable, there's no reason to participate in it from an emotional perspective, like in terms of unhealthy conflict. If you know that you're going to fight with someone at 
every six months, just as a random fact of being close to them, then anytime you have that fight, you know, well, hey, this actually doesn't matter. You know, it's just some random artifact coming up. We can discuss the underlying issue, but let's just take a pause on the emotional side of things. Uh, and then the final thing that I found really helpful was this idea of the victim, villain, hero triangle, which I think was very interesting and very subversive, but very true, which is the idea that in every interaction, people typically follow these archetypes of who's the victim, who's the villain, who's the hero. And this book just talks about completely getting rid of that. Like that's uh, an archetype that will um, that leads to unhealthy behaviors from every one of those because the hero who comes in to try and you know save the day is taking on accountabilities that they shouldn't. Um, they're they're you know not actually adding to the situation at all. They're providing a temporary solution. Um, the victim is playing the role of someone who's not you know um, actually asserting themselves enough or uh, healthily resolving conflict. Um, and all three participants should actually really just get to the root of kind of what they're talking about, take the labels off things. Um, so I think actually hitting conflict head on um, as per like rattle candor is incredibly important again to business culture. Like if you do not have a direct business culture it is very difficult to succeed because people will just not raise issues and you need to be able to raise issues in a very frequent and healthy manner in order for people to grow. And so I like, I genuinely, I'm, I'm always surprised when you see, successful people with egos, with big egos, because the very virtue of building something, I think means that your ego must get bruised so many times that it cannot exist because you will be wrong so many times. And if you don't have the ability to accept that you're wrong, I don't understand how people can get to where they need to go, um, like to, to, to actually reach that level of success. Yeah, it's funny. It seems like the biggest entrepreneurs at the same time as having no ego, they also have a massive ego. And I think it looks like, those entrepreneurs, they're extremely confident. They can be very sort of abrasive, but at the same time, they I do think they need. I think they need yeah. conviction. Yeah. Yeah. Conviction, hyper conviction. Um, something I wanted to ask at the beginning of the podcast, I'd love to sort of understand your emotional experience of starting a company. So like on a day-to-day, week-to-week, like you're 25, you're doing like the most stressful thing you can be doing. You must be working around the clock. How do you feel day to day? Like, is it like, are you always constantly pumped and motivated and just going towards this mission? Are you nervous, anxious, stressed? Like, what's the actual emotional understanding of how you feel? Yeah, I think not that stressed. Um, my bar for getting stressed is pretty high. Something has to be pretty wrong. Do you think that's something innate within you? Have you always been like that? No. Okay. I mean, I've always been decent. Yeah. Um, like, I'm, you know, definitely yeah. somewhat resilient, but it is definitely. Well, I, I've you know I've, I've been through all these situations, and so the threshold for something to reach my level of something is potentially risky here yeah. is quite high. You know, like a lot of situations, I'll be like, well, this doesn't matter in the scale of business. Let's just go forward, um, which I think is useful. And um, in general, su- hy- hyper stress is not a productive thing to ever experience. A, a medium degree of stress can be very useful as a stimulus. Um, the first two years of building a company were definitely very different. You know, it was, it was very kind of, we just had to do what we had to do. There was huge sort of urgency to ev- every single thing we did. Um, and we had no choice but to sort of work 100, 110 hour weeks. Um, I, I remember there was a story when we were in the, you know, co-working space um, and we had just hired, I think, our, our first employee um, outside the core, three of us. And then he walked in on a Monday and we've just been sleeping under the desks, you know, the entire <laughs> weekend um, without knowing how to turn the aircon on. So it was absolutely freezing. <laughs> so like, yeah, it was, it was, you, you kind of just have to do what you have to do. Right. Um, but I, I would say a uh, pretty stable place. I think exercise, I mean, look, if, I, if I'm going to share my personal philosophy, um, it's pretty simple. Four pillars. Uh, I've got to have slept. I've got to have socialized. I've got to have eaten and I've got to have exercised every single day. And if I haven't hit, if I'm feeling bad or I, I'm not feeling great and I go through one of these four things and they're not present, I don't let my, I discredit whatever narrative my brain is generating. So my brain will be like, oh, it's because of this. Oh, it's because you did this, you know? And then if you go through those and you're like, well, actually no, a fundamental need that I've recognized is fundamental to me being happy is missing. And if that's missing, your brain will generate narratives as to why you're feeling not good. But like, that's the most powerful technique that I've personally found um, because it's just a really basic checklist of like, get yourself on on track. And if those four things are hit, 
you know, I'm, I'm generally pretty much always pretty happy and stable. Yeah. yeah, that's fascinating. So then kind of going along with that train of thought, how did you feel day to day in that two years on sleeping under desk, et cetera, et cetera? And, w- and what were the things that got you through? Oh, definitely the team. It's pretty yeah. exhilarating. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, I, I enjoyed parts of it. It's also incredibly stressful. Yeah. Um, mainly because we're building on such experimental technology, right? Yeah. So, like, there was a you know a time where we're working on um, a, a way to try and transfer information from one smart contract to another, um, and we. It turns out actually that the code necessary to do this was in a low-level documentation that was only marked in one place on GitHub as a comment. Um, and actually the alignment of variables in a stack have to be aligned between the two, which is like very unusual for like a high level language like Solidity to have that feature associated with a function. And we just had to do this without sleeping. Like it was so time sensitive that we stayed up for more than 70 hours um, in order to get this done. And so like it, it was things like that. I think that were... Um, yeah, they're pretty taxing. Uh, I, I, I definitely try and avoid all nighters as much as possible. And I think at this level, if you're doing that, you're, you know, you're, something's wrong with your organization, right? Yeah. Like you should be at a very different level of leverage. The issues you deal with as urgent should be very different. Um, but then there's a different challenge, which is how do you constantly be proactive and propel the organization forward? How do you pull the levers of hyper growth at scale at an organizational level? And so at every different stage, you know, from one to 10, you are directly pulling the levers. From 10 to 50, you are hiring teams as their direct managers and getting them to pull the levers. From 50 to 300, you are designing the organization and the executive team that is gonna pull the levers of hyper growth at scale. They're all very different problems. And you have to be incredibly conscious about committing to only radically focusing on those at every stage. Otherwise you will lose, you will do the wrong thing. If you're the best individual contributor in the world, you're brilliant and your team is 300 people, you will lose. You'll be a genius with 299 supporters looking on, right? And and I think um, some of the most powerful organizations in the world are machines, which if you walk away, they will run forever. Like, you know, I think the eBay CEO famously said you could walk away from eBay and that thing would just run like for five years, headlessly producing profits. Now that's not going to prevent against disruption. You know, that, that's a much harder machine to build. And it's also not going to build aggressively in a category creating space like we are. But that is constantly the pursuit to create stability on a business model that is going to move and, and grow by itself. A bit, a bit of a selfish question here. So for context, Right now, I'm talking to a lot of founders day to day, and I feel a lot of imposter syndrome because a lot of them are much older than me. They've done crazy things, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if I think through for you, you put, you've recruited so much incredible talent. Um, you know, you're managing all these really, really large teams. Did the imposter syndrome ever creep through about being 25 and doing all these kinds of stuff, or is that something you just haven't really thought about? Yeah, always. I think there's always imposter syndrome. Um, but I think you build a great team around you. Right. So like I'm, I'm not doing everything. We've got an incredible executive team and investors don't, you know, just look at me. They look at the, the in yeah. particular, the executive team and the caliber of that team um, at this level of scale and, and the caliber of your operations. Um, and then the second thing I'd say is just like, and, and it's uh, the most important thing to do is kind of pick a few important things and then just do them well consistently. And then just always be learning. I don't think there's any magic um, to, to, building something. Um, so like in, imposter syndrome is just this, um, I think particularly in creating a startup, this thing that will prevent conviction or prevent you from taking bets that you should be taking. Um, but by definition, you have to be taking, you know, it's, if, if you want to take Peter Thiel's view or contrarian view to build something. Um, so I, I just try and think about that there's zero utility to imposter syndrome. Um, so I think if you if you can get your head around that and you can just keep going, then you know you'll you'll get to where you want to go. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Awesome way to frame it. Yeah. Well, that's been um, an excellent discussion. Should we go into the quick fire questions? Yeah, so it. Yeah. So one thing we do at the end of each episode is that we ask you a few rapid fire questions. Sure. I'm going to do the first three. Satch will do the second three. You ready for that? Yes. Cool. What's one of your favorite books and why? Mention something that you haven't already talked about. Uh, the Culture Series by Ian Banks. Okay. Um, and I love it because it depicts what I think a utopia should be. It's one of the very few books that has a, a non-dystopian utopia where I think that's an excellent place for humanity to end up. Awesome. What's one of your favourite podcasts and why? Uh, Tim Ferriss. Yeah, because I think you're kind of as a mirror to who is interviewing. 
um, he's very scientifically rigorous. So he, you know, he's not going to kind of bring on um, someone who's just spouting BS um, and just, I think, interview some of the coolest people. Yeah. He's been one of the biggest influences and one of our favorite people. I think we really love his open mindedness. He just has so many weird hobbies and he's done so many yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I, 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 I really want to meet him one day. He's a really cool guy. Who's been the most inspirational figure in your life? And you can't say your brother. Yeah. Um, I think. I'm, I don't know if this is most inspirational. Um, I'm a big fan professionally of the Collison brothers who made Stripe. They built an excellent culture, an excellent organization, um, and, and done it in a way that has, you know, they've, they've reached kind of enormous um, levels of scale. And, and I think fundamentally that's been down to asking questions and co like continuous learning. Um, and then I'm actually a really big fan of Jesse Itzler and his approach just to like, energy management um and sort of abundance of energy um i think has been you know he's kind of like a personal motivator because he just he's always pushing to sort of who is that more and experience more um he was one of the founder i think of it was net jets or it was some private jet service in the u.s it's, it's quite successful but he also runs sort of ultra marathons um and he's this sort of just you know he, his goal is to bring a hundred percent energy and, and kind of derive energy from doing activities, um, which Amazing. I try and take a, a, a leaf out of. Yeah, that sounds very up our alley. Um, what kind of music do you listen to? Oh, it depends. A lot of lo-fi when I'm working uh, or chilling out um, and EDM or electronic, a lot of Rufus. Um, if I'm like, you know, at a party or something or like trying to groove um, or on a Peloton, then I will absolutely blast Rufus. Ah, yeah. Love it. Okay. What's the craziest house party you've had? Uh, that we've had I, oh, probably my 16th where I tried to become really popular by just <laughs> allowing like hundreds of people to, to Was this over. when you were deep in your RuneScape days and you were trying to get a few friends? I, I, was, I was probably not playing Rune 2 at 16. Um, I definitely was not cool, very far from it. And I was like, this is my ticket to being cool. Um, and it was a disaster. There were so many gay crashes. Uh, but yeah, that was probably, I'm not going to say the craziest, but relative to, <laughs> relative to like age. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you do to switch off? Um, definitely socialize. Yeah. Yeah. So socialize with friends. Um, exercise is a great way to switch off. Uh, big one is for me is sauna, mm. um, which I find just physiologically yeah. like. Have you done an ice bath? Of course. Yeah. 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 We yeah. got an ice bath just out there actually. Uh, <laughs> I can do one after. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but big fan of, of that. I probably spend three or four hours in a sauna on Sunday. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah. Okay. Session. And last question, um, if you could leave our audience with one thing, you know, they're the demographic of their 20s to 30s, working at startups, trying to build things, interested in creating the future, what would it be? Mindfulness. Um, I think it's very easy to forget as you pursue goals that you should enjoy exactly this moment, literally as you're listening, and that that will serve you in all of your goals as well because you'll be coming at things from a place of intrinsic motivation rather than extrinsic motivation. So it's massive struggle to stay mindful while you're building a startup. But I think it's an incredible, if you can achieve it, um, you will not only be able to have more shots on goal because you'll be more sustainable, but you're just going to enjoy the entire process um, rather than kind of being living for sort of um, external metrics, which by definition, if you're building a startup, you are, you know, you're chasing blue line growth. How do I increase the market cap of the thing that I'm building? Yeah. That's fantastic. Crypto founder and Buddhist monk. Yeah, I was going to say, you're combo. very dynamic. Like, <laughs> I'm not that good at mindfulness. It's, it's partially like aspirational for me. Okay. Very right, few yeah. people are. Well, Robbie, thanks for coming on. That was awesome. Thanks, guys. That was an amazing discussion. And I think everyone watching is going to be absolutely captivated by the idea of Web3 and Web3 gaming. Yeah. I certainly am. I can't refute it. And, you know, if you're looking for your next company, Immutable, I'm sure is hiring soon at some point. We're hiring now. Okay. okay. We have 60 open roles. Wow. So, That's huge. Yeah. And, yeah, to the audience, probably have the most brilliant people out of any company that's in a couple hundred people in Australia, like the people we know, yeah. just product engineers, all brilliant people. Highly recommend looking at the high bar. <laughs> yeah. cool. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks for us. us.